This is episode 19, The World Is Not Enough. When oil tycoon Sir Robert King is murdered in cold blood at MI6 headquarters, M assigns James Bond to go and protect his daughter Electra. An anarchist named Renard, who was shot in, in the head with a bullet by another agent, has his eyes set on taking down the King pipeline and Electra along with it. While on assignment, Bond suddenly becomes suspicious of Electra's motives to move her pipeline. So that is The World Is Not Enough in a nutshell. Jay, what did you remember about this before we rewatched it recently? This is a bit of a common theme, Andy, for the Brosnan films because I didn't remember too much about the plot. It was more about the some of the characters or some of the actors. So I remember Electra King, and I actually remember that her, her full name in this movie. Robert Carlyle's character, and I knew he had something wrong with him that meant he couldn't feel pain, but I couldn't remember what the cause was. Uh, and obviously we find out in the movie that it's a bullet. I also remembered that Denise Richards was in there and she played a character called Christmas, but I couldn't remember if that's a first name or surname and I completely forgot she was a doctor. But otherwise, Andy, I didn't really remember much about The World Is Not Enough. What about you? Similar, the plot was kind of non-existent in my memory. So I didn't remember much about that. And it was more moments or people. So like you, I remembered Denise Richards. I remembered she was Dr. Christmas Jones. I remembered Robert Carlyle as the baddie. And although I've confirmed it in the summer earlier, I think he had a bullet in his head, but I wasn't sure at the time. I remember the boat chase on the Thames and around the Millennium Dome, which we'll get onto in a little bit. And I also remember John Cleese making an appearance. And I remember Goldie in a random role as well but I wasn't sure what part he played and then the the closest I got to the plot was I knew there was something involving either a gas or an oil pipeline but otherwise um, I couldn't remember much so it's just kind of little moments or scenes or, or people but not really a cohesive thought you know in terms of the boat chase scene I remember you know when we've been doing the podcast I remember that Bosnan had a, a boat chase scene on the Thames but I never I couldn't remember which film it was so as we've been re-watching them I've been kind of half expecting it to be that film yeah I I remembered it because I think it's maybe a nostalgia thing but this was the first Bond film I saw at the cinema so I remember I think I went with my mates for this one and uh, I remember that being one of the first scenes the way the boat shoots out of the wall so that kind of stuck with me well, let's, let's get into it a little bit more. So some information we're collecting as we go along. We've got the villains. This is quite a long list, actually. We've got Electra King. We've got Renard. We have Sasha Davidov. Gabor. Mr. Bullion. And the Cigar Girl. So six villains in all. And we have three Bond girls. Dr. Christmas Jones. Electra King, who appears on both lists. And Dr. Molly Warmflash. And the theme song is The World Is Not Enough by Garbage. And the opening credits. So we've got the usual models here. But we've got a bit of a common theme here with the Bosnian opening credits. And we've got the kind of like what the, the main point or the, the storyline through the, the film is appearing in the opening credits. So we've got lots of oil special, special effects here. And that's including models being covered in oil, pools of oil oil pumps so we've got flames and globes as well so we've we've got this common theme with especially i, I think it's more noticeable in in the the bosnian films where the story certain elements from the film are appearing in the opening credits and a lot of oil as i mentioned the all important body count so this is james bond kills only he he's got a healthy 27 in the world is not enough yeah so on to gadgets again quite the array we have uh, the boat, uh, which Q says is not finished. We'll get on to later. We have a, a protective inflatable jacket that turns into a kind of like a ball or a zorb. We have glasses, a detonator. We have x-ray glasses. There's a credit card lockpick and an Omega Seamaster. So the time it takes for Bond to say Bond James Bond is 30 minutes, 25 seconds. And I thought, Jay, that you'd left that in from last week's notes when I first saw it, but it's actually exactly the same as, as last week's film, which is uh, something of a coincidence. 
Uh, we do see Martini, but we have no hat wearing or hat throwing this time round. So next question from me, Jay. What was your favourite scene of the film? Andy, I really struggled with my favourite scene here. And it wasn't because there were so many. So I think for me, it was probably the the opening boat chase scene with, you know, we've got the Thames and the, the dome and we've got a lengthy, lengthy chase scene here. So for me, it was that, that's the one that stood out for me. But I, when I was typing up, you know, my note here, I, I really struggled to think nothing, nothing really jumped out apart from the opening boat chase scene. So what about you? Opening scene for me, I thought was tremendous. Uh, we've got the, obviously the boat chase on the Thames, the way it fires out of the wall, the Millennium Dome, just really, really cool. I wrote later on in the notes, for me, it's probably the best Bond opening so far of the franchise, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed that. I also really like the scene at Zakovsky's base with the helicopters, with the tree cutters attached. I thought that was a nice scene as well. Uh, so next up, we're tracking this every week. How many times did you reach for your phone? Zero times this week. I was tempted one or two times, but I I made a note in in the pad to just say research this, research that kind of thing. So I was I've been really good, Andy. You know, very well um, model student here. Um, so zero for I don't know how many films in a row now. It, it's quite a lot. What about you? Yeah, you really are teacher's pet, aren't you? Uh, just the ones for me <laughs> this time, uh, and that was to. Google who Electra's bodyguard is. It's, a, it's a, a common theme for me. I tend to Google once or twice when I see someone that I vaguely recognise but not sure where from. I try not to do it so much when I'm watching Bond, but curiosity got the better of me. Which bodyguard was it? The um, what's I can't remember his name now, but he's uh, he's the one we'll talk about later on that made an appearance in Gladiators and was a was well, trained to be a pro wrestler. So I recognise the other one, and that's the one I made a note to research. I didn't look at my phone, but the other one looked familiar. And I said to the missus, what's he out of? And she couldn't recall, but she recognised him as well. So I just wondered if it was the same bodyguard that we both kind of thought of. Yeah, the, he had a, a certain ring to him, and then he wasn't who I thought he was anyway. But, um, yeah, m moving on. We, we can't continue the rating room without discussing the rating. So what was this one out of 10 for you, Jay? So this might shock people, I don't know. But for me, I think it shot you, Andy, didn't it? So for me, it was a 5 out of 10. And I really, really struggled with this one. And it's the only film so far, Andy, where I press the a button on my controller to see how long was left on the film. And I did that three times during the film, I just really struggled. And it wasn't because we we watched it late. We watched it in the evening. Um, it wasn't because I was tired. It wasn't because other things were happening. I just really struggled. It just didn't click with me. And we, we can talk about it a bit more in depth and where the rankings are. But for me, it just seemed a bit of a... Um, a significant drop compared to Bosman's first two films that we discussed in you know, the last couple of weeks. We could talk about it a bit more, but so for me, it was five out of 10. What about you, Andy? So this may shock you and the listeners as well, but I love this film and I gave it eight out of 10. And I think other than a few things that we'll get into that let it down a little bit in terms of, you know, silliness or things that didn't quite make sense, could have really challenged Goldfinger for, you know, top honours. It was, maybe, maybe it was, I was in a good mood that night when I watched it. Maybe, you know, the stars had aligned, but for some reason I just, I was really into it, really enjoyed it. And it was far better than I remembered it being. So eight out of 10 for me. It was just really surprising, you know, because just for our listeners, well, what we do is we, we write our notes separately and then we kind of combine them. So we don't see each other's scores until the other person kind of reads, reads, so I will send it over to Andy and he will see what my score is and Andy will put his on there and then I will see it when Andy sends it over. But this week you actually texted me, didn't you, Andy, to say about my score. 
so I wasn't wait. You know, I didn't get to wait Cadacy to um, read it when I read the notes. So Andy actually texted me to say um, how shocked he was with my scoring, and you kind of indicated what you were planning to to give it, didn't you? Um, as well. Yeah, if if we were younger and part of the the woke generation, we'd probably have a Twitter war and then never speak to each other again because our <laughs> opinions are so different. But what we're going to have instead is a healthy debate on this podcast as to why I'm right and you're wrong. And you're going to challenge me on that. And then our listeners are going to hopefully tweet us and send us social media messages siding with one or the other. Or maybe they'll have a completely different opinion themselves. It'd be good to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Let us know if you agree with my 5 out of 10 or Andy's 8 or, you know, in the middle. So it's there's obviously no right or wrong. Um, as well I think for me when you said it was close to Goldfinger I thought it was surprising just because when we did Goldeneye we we both obviously rated Goldeneye quite high so in my head I never anticipated you scoring it higher than kind of Goldeneye you know in terms of where you said oh it, it's near Goldfinger um, I just was a bit surprised but I was surprised with my score as well, Andy, you know, because I've not rewatched really this film for years and years. And in my head, I thought the the weakest film of Brosnan was his last one, which it might be, you know, we've got to rewatch it again and discuss it next week, next week's episode. But for me, I thought Brosnan was quite consistent apart from his last film. But for me, he's had, you know, two good ones and then a drop down. Yeah, I um, I was surprised with my score as well. Definitely better than I remembered it being. So we've got two different opinions. We need a tiebreaker. And that's where your wife comes in. So what does she think of this? So she was like me, actually. So she did fall asleep during some of this. So I can't kind of quantify how long she fell asleep for. But she she did that thing. And I don't know if it's the same with your Mrs. Andy when you watch a film. Where... I kind of sit upright to watch a film, might slouch a little bit, you know, to the left or right. But I could see in the corner of my eye, quite early in this film, she was kind of like slowly laying down, getting the pillows ready to rest her head on, to kind of get into the sleeping position. So she did fall asleep a bit um, during this, but I can't tell you exactly how much um, she missed of the film. But after the, after the film finished, and I was just like, you know, jotting down um, some final notes, in my pad I said to her what did you think of it you know for the wife comment and she said straight away this is like you know one of the worst films and um, one of the worst Bond films um, in the franchise so far and I said to her what worse than Moonraker because I know you know Moonraker you you've scored um, low down on your list and even on my list but I don't think from we can talk about it later I don't think it's the bottom one on my list and she said, no, Moonraker is the worst because she, she hated Moonraker. She hates sci-fi. She hates Star Wars and stuff like that. So it's her worst film. So she said, no, it's not as worse as Moonraker, but it was the the second worst for her. But she also made a, a comment which made me chuckle because, you know, I've said numerous times on this podcast, Andy, to yourself and, you know, to the listeners that the missus has been saying how much she's been looking forward to the Bosnian era all the way through the podcast. You know, since we started, she's saying, oh, I can't wait to get to Bosnian. After we finished watching this, she said to me, oh, I've realized now that it wasn't Pierce Bosnian that I like. It's Daniel Craig that she liked. So now we've got to get through one more film before she gets onto the Bond films that she, she likes. So that did make me chuckle because, um, Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig don't look nothing like each other. <laughs> I think it's very hard to confuse those two Bond actors. Yeah, that, when I saw that comment, it reminded me of my wife's confusion between Michael Caine and Nicolas Cage. She always gets those two names confused. And they are pretty much polar opposites in terms of looks and acting ability and <laughs> fame and everything you can think of, really. So, yeah, that did make me chuckle. Um... My wife didn't watch this film. She never does. But you know, she I've still got the verbal agreement in place for later on in the franchise, so we'll come back to that in a future episode. Uh, a few of the facts though, as we get a little bit deeper into the film. So the runtime was two hours eight minutes. Again, feels like it's right in the ballpark of all the Bond films we've had so far. Not not too long, not too short. Seems to be right in the middle. Uh released in nineteen ninety nine and directed by Michael Apted. 
So some general points now before we start digging a bit deeper into the, the film. So as always, I'd like to kick off the budget and the box office stat. The budget for The World Is Not Enough was $135 million and that is for the fifth film in a row now makes it the most expensive Bond film so far in the franchise. So we've got this consistent theme now where they are just breaking the budget for each film and like I said, it's the fifth time in a row that they've done this. So how did The World Is Not Enough do in the box office? So it took $361.7 million in worldwide box office performance and when you adjust that to today's money, that's just shy of 625 million, so very healthy. But I thought this was interesting. When you look at the, the three Brosnan films, they've broken the one billion mark in worldwide box office at the time. So he's he's been a very successful Bond actor, I think. Even though this film we've got mixed opinions, I think we can both agree the the three Brosnan films have been performed well at the box office shifting gears slightly a bit of a, a sad point in that this is desmond Llewellyn's last bond film uh, shortly after the world is not enough was released he died in a car accident uh, of course played q in 17 of the 18 bond films released between 63 and 99 the exception being live or let die so 17 out of 19 total that's a, it's a pretty good run and Interestingly, of course, what comes with that is the fact that he's the only actor in the original Bond series to have worked alongside five of the actors that played James Bond. So he's the he's the one constant of the series so far. So it's quite sad that this is his farewell movie. And that's never going to be beaten, is it now? I'm very, very doubtful. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and especially since, as we've seen, the 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 length between films seems to be getting greater each time as well you know it's not the every year of the connery era or the every two years of the moore era it seems to be sort of every three four five years so uh, it's going to take quite an effort to, to beat 17 appearances and final point for me before i pass back to you jay we're continuing the link between bond and wrestling uh john seru plays electra's bodyguard gabor uh, seru was trained at the malenko wrestling academy in florida and also featured in the Australian version of Gladiators. I believe his name was Vulcan, if memory serves me correctly. Do you know the wrestling academy there, Andy, in Florida? I know the Malenkos, quite a famous name in, in wrestling. So um, I'm familiar with the Malenkos, but I'm not familiar with John Saru. Well, he, when I said earlier I had one look at the phone, that was who I was Googling. But I think I recognised him more from the Gladiators side of things when you know when they've done like the uh, what do you call them like the international version. Uh, they, pro they probably had like UK versus Australia or whatever. So that's probably where I recognise him from. I don't remember him in any any fame or fortune in wrestling. So Andy, going back to your point regarding the Bond films released, one thing I have noticed, and I don't know if you picked up on it, the Bond films come thick and fast. So you know, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, we commented that. Well, in terms of Sean Connery, they were banging them out pretty much one a year, you know, at the very beginning of the franchise. Now, with Brosnan, I've just double-checked this, they're every two years, and obviously we know when we get into Daniel Craig, there's a bit more of a um, time difference between the films. But it seemed in the 90s, they were definitely on it more in terms of maximising performance in terms of the box office but i wonder the two per year is making up for the last time you know with the, the gap between dalton and bosnan yeah it could well be because uh, there were what six year gap between licensed to kill and golden eye and i'm just thinking back roger moore was basically every two years wasn't he and then when dalton took over there was no gap there so again so it had been up until 89 it was kind of every two years for the most part so it does kind of go back into what was the status quo? You are correct, Andy. I was just looking at our little spreadsheet at the years that each of the films were released. And yeah, there it was one year, then it went to two years. Then, like you said, the, the six-year gap. And obviously with Daniel Craig, it's a, it's a bit longer. But we can talk about Daniel Craig films when we get there. We're kind of jumping ahead there. But yeah, it was an interesting point, Andy, there. So moving on, I've got a couple more points before we kind of get into the other regular segments. So 
The daughter of Eunice Gason, who played Sylvia Trench in Doctor No and from What Shall We Love, appears in a casino scene. So I like that little throwback to the the Connery era there. And also, this film is notable as being one of the few Bond films in which James Bond himself kills a leading female character. And you you made a comment in the notes, Andy, about that later on. We, we can pick that up um, when we kind of do our talk through. The rain room. Moving on to goofs and continuity errors. I've picked out one and Andy's got one here. So just after Bond and Dr. Christmas Jones climb out of the pipe bond is holding his shoulder and his blazer sleeves are up however in the next shot his arms are by his side and his blazer is all neat he's a a fast changing man i guess Uh, another little one from from me so at the beginning bond is chasing another boat and he fires a torpedo now there's it fires the top torpedo first but when they show him fire the second torpedo uh, the bottom hole is empty so he fires the same torpedo again so clearly they couldn't remember which which one came first. Uh, just a little continuity there. I'm sure there'll be other things we'll notice as we go along, but shall we get into the film proper now? So of course, we start with the gun barrel sequence, and we mentioned this the last couple of episodes. It's the same sequence as Golden Eye and Tomorrow Never Dies. But the music's different again, isn't it? This is the third one in a row where they've got the same visual, but three different music tracks. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to use the, the same terminology there, Andy. The the visuals are the same, but yes, the the music is is definitely different. So that was a good pick there, Andy, by yourself. So let's get into the movie now. So we've had a gun battle scene, and we're we're in, we're in the opening scene now. So we're in Bill Bauer in Spain, and we see Bond in some glasses, and I thought this was a bit weird. And this is one of the few times that Bond actually wears glasses and I'm not counting sunglasses here. So this is just normal glasses. And I think, Andy, I did try to do a bit of research here and I do believe this is the only time we've seen Bond since on a Majesty's Secret Service where he's undercover playing Hillary. And we have a little throwback to that film, actually, don't we, later on in the podcast? We do indeed. I, I didn't actually remember the glasses from I mentioned the Secret Service. I thought this was the first time. So I, I immediately questioned myself, like, surely Bond doesn't need glasses? Thinking, you know, he's a secret agent. He needs to be at top of his game. And if he's got poor eyesight, that's not going to come, come in handy when he comes to things like shooting targets. So I thought it had to be a gadget. There's no way he needs glasses. Must be a gadget of some sort. Yeah, I agree, because... I would not think, you know, when you say about not wearing glasses, I think it may be wear contact lenses, but I think he's the type of bloke that would probably get him operated on, vision corrected, wouldn't he? He couldn't risk, you know, having, um, losing a contact lens in a, in the shootout or something. No, he's got to, he's got to be on his game at all times. He can't show any weakness. So moving on, Bond is meeting with a Swiss bank to recover some money. And the bank is planning to, the, well, the banker is planning to kill Bond. And we find out that the money is from another double O agent as well. And this is typical Bond, you know, we're, we're a minute, two minutes in, and we see Bond checking out the secretary as well before everything kicks off. Then the banker is killed by the, the secretary as well before Bond is saved by an unseen sniper. Yeah, Bond ends up escaping. Um, he uses the rope from the window blinds, which I thought was quite. Um, quite. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Is. Resourceful. There we go. Quite a resourceful way to escape, but just so happened to be the perfect length for him to jump out the window and land on the pavement below without hurting himself, which is um, such a coincidence, isn't it? Or maybe he planned it that way. Who knows? It's almost like they've scripted it, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> we move from Bill Bauer to MI6. Uh, Bond and Money Penny have their usual banter. We'll cover this a little bit later on in more detail. Bond returns the money to a wealthy man named Sir Robert King. Uh, King leaves. Bond and M have a glass of bourbon with ice. And the ice begins to bubble. So Bond notices that something must be wrong. So he he, uh, he deduces that the money which he's handled might itself be dangerous. And in the nearby lab, the metallic security strip in one of the bills burst into flames and the money explodes killing King and blowing a large hole in the outer wall of MI6 HQ. 
then Bond looks out through the hole and sees a woman. And this is, we find out, we, we, we're coining her as the cigar, cigar girl um, on the boat who then tries to shoot him. I thought that was um, a nice little scene there um, as well. Then Bond borrows a speedboat from Q and gives chase. What I noticed about this is that Q shouts to Bond that the boat's not finished. It's one of his uh, one of his Q specials. But Bond's got no trouble with any of the controls. Bit strange. I, I agree there, Andy. When I saw your note, because when, when that happened, I thought, you know, he, he says he's not finished. And then, you know, sometimes I start doubting myself because when that happened, I thought, and obviously we, we see the, um, the, the boat chase scene over the next few minutes. I'm thinking, well, it's not, it's not finished. So how, how does he know all the gadgets work? But then I started doubting myself. I'm thinking, oh, maybe they, they have briefings internally where Q does, oh, I'm working on this and it's going to do X, Y, and Z. But he obviously, you know, like you, you, know, you mentioned about the torpedoes and there's various bits throughout these, this chase scene as well, where he's doing bits. But yeah, I did, when I saw your comment, it did remind me, I, I, that's what I thought in terms of the, the actual, the, the speedboat. And a note here that I've made where we see Bond's speedboat do a spin in the air. And I, I felt this was a bit of a throwback as well to another Roger Moore film, actually. And it was to do with the, the cork screw jump and the because uh, when this happened Andy I was half expecting them to do that little bit of silly music you know where they did with the corkscrew jump oh, so this is yeah. from I yeah the know. man with the golden gun and when they did that I was half expecting them to do that little sound effect that they did but thankfully they didn't yeah they learned their lesson there uh, so Bond's in the speedboat and he has to dive into the water to avoid a collapsing bridge so he goes underwater and he does the the tight straightening gimmick that he did in uh, GoldenEye when he was in the tank, but this time he's underwater in a boat. Uh, quite a nice little touch there. And then a bit more comedy where uh, he splashes on the wheel clampers and takes the speedboat on land. Ends up travelling a little bit through the streets via a restaurant. And as I say via a restaurant, I think it's through the restaurant, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is through a restaurant. And when this was happening, the, the wife, you know, she was awake here did say that this was far-fetched and stupid plus bond is causing lots and lots of damage as well so i don't know whether mi6 ever gets a bill um from you know the, the local council about all the damage that they caused but there was a nice bit here where bonds when we get further along near the end of the chase bond speedboat kind of flies in the air and then bond jumps onto the rope that's swinging from the the hot air balloon and that the, the cigar girl has stolen. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it brings brings to end quite a really, really good scene, I thought. She's surrounded by several helicopters, and so there's no way out. So what she does is she takes her own life. She shoots one of the gas tanks and ends up blowing herself and the balloon up. Bond goes flying, uh, falls onto the Millennium Dome, as it was then called, um, rolls down, and ends up injuring his collarbone. And I mentioned this earlier, um, Loved this scene, and I thought the note I put was maybe the best open to a Bond ever, at least up to this point. My note, Andy, after I saw your note, was it's high octane, included a couple of different locations, and I think it's very good. You know, it's a, a high point of the film as well, straight away. It's, it's a very strong start. I want to, so my counterpoint was do you think, because I think I probably preferred the GoldenEye opening scene, less action. But I think Bosnan, because we said, didn't we? Both said in GoldenEye opening scene was very good. And we, I think we both queried it in that podcast episode that it was one of the strongest openings, if not the strongest. And, you know, we've had two very strong openings from Bosnan in the franchise. Has, has he had the best opening so far? I think he has. And I think it's a good shout when you mention GoldenEye. I think as standalone scenes, I preferred The World Is Not Enough opening scene. And for all the reasons you mentioned, high octane, full of action, the locations, just, just a really, really cool scene all round. I think where GoldenEye is helped is not only the scene, but also the fact that it's the first time we see Bond. So that's your introduction to Bond. Whereas in this, obviously, we know who he is. We know what he's all about. So it's it's maybe not as impactful as a as a debut scene, but as, an, as a scene, just as a standalone, I, I think the action 
was was better in this, in my opinion. So let's move on to the opening title. So that cuts into the opening music now. And David Arnold composed the soundtrack for The World Isn't Enough, and this is his second Bond soundtrack that he did. And as mentioned earlier, Garbage performed the title song, and the song was written by David Arnold and Don Black. Yeah, this is actually the fifth song that Don Black has written for the Bond franchise. Uh, the others being Thunderbolt, Diamonds Are Forever, The Man With The Golden Gun, and Tomorrow Never Dies. Interestingly, the theme song includes references to previous films, uh, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and Live and Let Die. And final point from me, The World Is Not Enough soundtrack peaked at number 11 in the UK charts. So respectable, but not setting the world on fire. Indeed, but setting the world on fire, well, I think it's setting the world on fire, Andy. Garbage's debut album and the follow-up album each sold over 4 million copies worldwide. So... I think that's very respectable. I must admit, Andy, Garbage, their music isn't the type of music that I listen to, but, you know, I, I was a um, a teenager when this film came out, so I was aware of Garbage and certain songs that they did, and if it came onto the radio or if I was streaming, like, a, a random playlist, if they came on, I think I'd recognise the songs. But I couldn't name you any, so I don't know if you if you like their type of music or not. No, you took the words right out of my mouth. They're, I couldn't name any songs of theirs right now, but I probably would recognise them if you played me some. So, moving on, back to the film. So, we've had the, the opening theme now, and the opening scene is the funeral, and we then transition to MI6 in Scotland. So, at Robert King's funeral service, Bond notices King's daughter, Electra. So... He's clocking the totty straight away there, Andy. I, I think typical Bond there. And later on at the MI6 retreat in Scotland, Bond discovers that Electra had been kidnapped some time prior and held ransom for a considerable sum. He notices that the money he recovered from Robert King is equal to the ransom and concludes that King's death was more of a message than a simple terror attack. And it's during these scenes we see the return of Bill Tanner and Charles Robinson during the briefing. And M seems to be taking this very personally, um, it's not just any old mission for her. Um, but of course, Bond needs to get signed off by the Doctor. He's hurt his collarbone on the Millennium Dome, so he needs to see a Doctor. Q Bond seducing Doctor Molly Warmflash, which is uh, which is quite the Bond name, a Bond girl name, excuse me. It is. And Annie, just going back to your point, M does seem to be taking it personally, and I think you know. The, the first two Bond films that we've seen with M in it, she came across as quite stern, quite cold, but you're seeing a different side of her in this movie. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit more of a human side to her, which uh, we, we may see later on in this film and in the franchise. Uh, but moving on, we also see Q, and he's demonstrating some bagpipes that are equipped with machine guns and flames um, and Bond and him are having their usual back and forth and he uses the line pipe down 007 which uh, I thought was quite amusing see that one bypassed me that one Andy I completely missed that one but the, the you know this this next one did make me chuckle and Q also introduces Bond to his new assistant and Bond makes a quip that does that make him R which which you know like I said did make me chuckle and R is played by John Cleese, who's famous for a number of roles, including Monty Python, Forty Towers, and A Fish Called Wonder. And out of those three roles, Andy, I've only seen, well, I've seen Forty Towers and A Fish Called Wonder. I've never seen any Monty Python sketches or films. I don't recall Monty Python that much. I must have seen clips at least, but I've, I don't think I've ever sat down and watched a full film. But Forty Towers is is one of the best sitcoms ever produced in my opinion so he's uh this is quite the quite the role you know john cleese taking a role like this is, is quite the get for the bond franchise i would say definitely I, I agree there seems to be a bit of a tension between q and r as well there does yeah i i liken it to a similar vein to say q and bond particularly in the connery and Moore eras where there's a there's a bit of like adult child type relationship and he sees R as a bit of a 
a, well, I mean, he is a an underling, isn't he? I think he even refers to him as a as a young man. Whereas you know, this is John Cleese. He's he's not exactly young at this point. I think I don't know how old he is, but I'm, I'm guessing he's probably in his sixties at this point, or thereabouts. So uh, for him to be called a young man does seem a bit strange. Um, but let's let's continue on. Bond goes to another briefing held by M. Uh, she declares the likely suspect behind the bombing is a man named Victor Zokas, a.k.a. Renard, uh, an international terrorist who occasionally hires out skills to anyone with money. And at part of this briefing, there's a line somewhere, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but Bond uses the word vacation. But Bond is British, so surely he should be saying the word holiday. That is a, a good pick there, Andy, because... I I completely missed that. I wonder if there's uh, a little bit too um, too much American influence creeping in here, but I'm surprised nobody picked that up when doing the read through. Uh, but anyway, we we then see a huge 3D hologram of Renard that they're showing to Bond to kind of demonstrate that there's a bullet lodged in his brain and it's slowly killing him. This is where we find out that Renard doesn't actually feel pain because of this, but he is he's slowly killing, slowly dying. But doesn't feel pain so that that raises all kinds of questions in terms of how on earth is bond going to stop him what did you think of the big 3d hologram did you did you just think uh you know it, it's modern techno oh well it's kind of futuristic modern technology in you know in the 90s because for me it's the first time anything's like that's been in a bond film and it's so big wasn't it <laughs> it was like i'm sure i just had to think i'm sure it's bigger than bond I'm trying to think where they were doing it. I'm sure it's like massive. I'm trying to think how the scale of it was obviously really, really big. I think it's, yeah, it's pretty sizable. I, I felt it was unnecessary. It's almost like they're using technology for the sake of showing they've got technology rather than putting it to good use for, for something a bit more meaningful or value add. I agree, Andy. So carrying on dr warm flash has signed off and cleared bond and he can now return to active duty so that's positive for bond money penny is a bit sassy to the doctor here after m notes that the doctor has documented that bond has exceptional stamina so moving on we're in azerbaijan and bond travels to electra's location near baku where she is overseeing the construction of a fiber's pipeline Bond introduce himself, but he doesn't use the Bond, James Bond introduction, which me and the missus picked up on. He's saving it for the right moment, clearly. But Universal S... Bleh, I'll do that again. But Universal Exports is back. Feels like a long time since we've heard that. Um, and in fact, Universal Exports has featured in three other Bond films so far. On a Secret Service, For Your Eyes Only, and License to Kill. So that's, that seems to be like the the go-to cover story for Bond. You think by now someone would be onto it. But anyway, um, it seems Electra's company's having a bit of trouble with the locals. Uh, she turns up, she meets them at um, what I think is an old church, um, but she says that they won't destroy the church and they'll detour the new pipeline, which seems to please the locals. One one thing I thought was very strange here, or just seemed a little a bit take me to take me by surprise, we get a cameo from Omar Jalili, the comedian, um, which I, I didn't remember at all, but it was it was fun to see him. Um, interesting side note, he did an interview in 2021 where he stated that the role he was playing was to work with the Turkish intelligence uh, when with 007, but this got cut in the script and they changed it to generic Azerbaijani oil pipe foreman. So that's, uh, that's quite the relegation that he's uh, experienced there. And there's also somewhere in here a lecture questions Bond about losing a loved one. And he quite tactfully avoids the question, which I thought was quite interesting in terms of how he didn't answer it one way or another. I agree there, Andy, because we've obviously got one more film for Brosnan to appear in. And as far as I recall, and correct me, Andy, if I'm wrong here, there's been no mention of Bond being married. Is that right? Is this the closest we've had in the Brosnan era? I think it is. The, the last 
mention of his wife, I think, was Dalton, wasn't it? In was it Licence to Kill, where um, at the wedding, uh, yeah. Mm. Whereas, yeah, the, in this, and we talked about it being a series of series, and there's, you know, this is not a hard reboot, but more of a, a refresh in some ways. But this, this scene to me lent itself to me thinking that this was a continuation, and that he's avoiding the question because he doesn't want to talk about his departed wife. Yeah, I, I agree. And talking, you know, moving on now, we we get the bit now where Bond joins a lecture on a brief inspection of the line in some snowy mountains. And this, I think, is the first time that Brosnan has a skiing scene. And me and the wife both said it seems like quite a while that Bond has been seen skiing because, you know, we, we've commented before in earlier podcasts that Roger Moore as kind of, you know, well, we associate Roger Moore with the skiing um, side of Bond. And this is the first time we think that Bosnan has appeared in a skiing scene. We've said before in previous ones where Connery is kind of like the scuba diving Bond, with Roger Moore is the, the skiing Bond. And this is the first time in the three films so far for Bosnan that we, we kind of think we see him as skiing there, Andy. So I don't know if I've missed anything. We we see the area snowed over and they must you know, must ski to the right spot so they jump off the, the helicopter. But then they are shortly attacked by a small group of men piloting these flying vehicles with parachutes. I don't know what the, the correct technical term is for, for those vehicles. This is where the wife says she wasn't impressed with this and stated that the chase was too long. And I think I've said in previous scenes, she doesn't like too long a chase. She's, she's commented a few times where fight scenes or chase scenes are going on too long. But there's an explosion here that causes a small avalanche burying Bond and Electra. And this is where Bond deploys the rapid inflating sphere coat that Andy mentioned in the gadget section at the top of the, the podcast to protect them. However, Electra panics from claustrophobia as well and Bond rapidly flee, frees her from the the snow and takes her to a house to recuperate i think the uh, aforementioned flying vehicles were actually like snowmobiles weren't they were but they were fan powered fan assisted so they kind of looked a little bit like hovercrafts but uh, with but for the snow i think um so yeah they're back at back at the house electra wants bond to stay to protect her we know what she means by that and bond turns her down I mean, the note, The only thing I could write here was WTF. Unbelievable. Uh, but like, little, little, sorry, go on. I was going to say, it's not often, is he? He, he turns down um, an attractive woman. I mean, if it, if it was something he'd injured that wasn't his collarbone, then, you know, maybe he's got a reason. But, yeah, took me a little bit by surprise. This is a, obviously Bond turning over a new leaf, at least for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> next up, Bond is at Zukovsky's Casino. And he's got his x-ray glasses on, and he noticed that everyone seems to be armed. And then we shortly thereafter meet Zukovsky's bodyguard, Mr. Bullion, who is played by the British DJ Goldie, which is quite a nice thing they've done with the name there, Mr. Bullion and Goldie. Well, yeah, well done. Uh, for those not in the know, Goldie is famous primarily for being a DJ, but he's also featured in a handful of movies. He was in Guy Ritchie's Snatch alongside Brad Pitt, Jason Statham and Benicio Del Toro, who of course we saw in license to kill uh, to me it just seemed like a really random casting like why goldie other than other than the the name you know mr bullion it's not real not something i would have considered it's strange i agree andy this is a a random casting here with goldie and i remember goldie you know from being a kid and his music being around at that time but it is random because if it was an independent movie, you can kind of imagine producers would cast celebrities in the films, you know, to increase the exposure. But this is obviously a Bond film, massive big budget movie, and they don't really need that. So it was a bit of a, a random casting, I, I agree there. This film probably did more for Goldie than Goldie did for the film, I would argue. Uh, but of course, that means that Bond needs to meet Zukovsky again. Um, who we saw in Goldeneye. And this this is the part, where, and I'm not sure if I've discussed this on the pod or not, or just offline with you, Jay, but my, my dad's a big Bond fan, and he remembers Robbie Coltrane and Zukovsky, and he always remembers him using the line, 
ah, Bond, James Bond, which is was quite amusing. And it's at this point where he, he does that when Bond enters the room and he goes, ah, Bond, James Bond, which uh, I find quite amusing. It's a little bit of a, a Mickey take, um, but, but funny nonetheless. I agree, Andy. And yeah, we discussed it outside the, the podcast and I never remembered that. But when you said it and your dad, you know, when you said about your dad saying that, when it happened, when we, me and the wife was watching this live, it just it just made me recall your conversation with your dad. So I thought that was quite funny and nice. And yeah, it is a bit of a Mickey take, isn't it, out of Bond? Sukovsky tells Bond that Renard is a former KGB agent and may be working for the Russian oil barons in the region who want the King Pipeline destroyed. Then Electra comes to this casino to show she isn't afraid of her enemies. And she ends up losing uh, a million on a high-low draw, but is quite gracious in defeat there, which I thought was a bit odd when it happened. And we kind of, like, you know, obviously find out later on um, why she's not really that fussed. We meet Renard for the first time when we meet a man named Davidoff, Electra's security chief, and a nuclear weapons scientist named Arkoff, who also secretly works for Renard. And this is in a, I don't know if this is a, a famous location, but it's quite dark and mysterious, this, this scene is. Renard is played by Scottish actor Robert Carlyle, and Carlyle is famous for a string of roles, including both the Trainspotting films, The Full Monty, and 28 Weeks Later. He has also appeared in a range of TV shows, including Hamish Macbeth, Stargate Universe, and Once Upon a Time, and Andy, I've seen quite a lot of Robert Carlyle films there that I've just mentioned. And Hamish Macbeth is always something that I recall because as a kid, I remember my parents watching that on the weekend because he played a, a, a Scotsman. And I think he, from memory, was a, a police officer or some sort. Yeah, that rings a bell. And the films you mentioned, other than the most recent train spotting, I've watched all of those. Uh, the Full Monty is one that stands out. Um, based in Sheffield, which is quite close to where we we both live, where's where I, I think we both went to university there as well. So familiar with the city. It's a bit strange uh, for a Scotsman to play a Yorkshireman, but uh, I think he did a, a decent job. But he's not, a, he's not a Scotsman or a Yorkshireman in this film. He is, he is Renard, and he's very unhinged in this scene. He kills Arkov for failing to kill Electra and orders Davidoff to take Arkov's place on a secret mission the next day so of course Davidoff agrees uh, a really good introduction is it's obviously not the full ticket uh, moving on Bond and Electra are in bed together of course he couldn't say no forever could he and it's at this point in the podcast we bring back the very famous segment nipple watch there's a brief moment where there is and this this is a pun get ready for it an electrifying show of skin See what I did there, Jay? See what I did there? I did, and I missed this nipple watch, Andy. So it's only when I was reading your notes that I, I, I saw that there was a nipple watch. So I did miss that. And then I saw your pun, which did make me chuckle. I do like a good pun. Um, I like a good nipple. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, Bond slips out of Electra's mansion, goes to Davidoff's office looking for more leads. And when Davidoff returns, Bond kills him. Davidoff is played by Urich. Thompson and this is where he the the one that I thought he looked familiar and I made a note when watching it to kind of research but we couldn't quite place where we've seen him before and as part of the research that we do um, we found out that he was from Banshee which is a, a TV show um, from America and Bond gives the so this this was a bit random so Bond gives the pilot a, a pair of trainers and changes the fake ID in the aeroplane as well. So Bond is undercover twice. He's, he's undercover too deep now. So I don't know. He's not a, a double agent. He's pretending to be a part of the crew, but then the crew pretend to be part of, I don't know, it's the UN or the, the Russian military. I can't quite recall. So we, we see him arrive at an old Soviet underground nuclear weapons facility that is being inspected by the UN. Everyone just seems to be fine with the fact that he's replaced Davi Davidoff. They don't think he is Davidoff. 
because I think one of them questions where's Davidov, and he's a you know whatever he says, but he just replaces him. Everyone just goes along with it. It's like seems a little. I would expect a little bit more questioning. Yeah, I don't think they've done the. You know, when you start a new job, Andy, and you kind of had a part of your induction, some kind of security briefing, or you know, make sure no one tailgates you when you walk through any kind of doors that you need to swipe. They've just seemed to have missed that kind of induction session. Especially for some villains, you would think they'd be quite suspicious, wouldn't you? Particularly knowing what the plan is to become. It's, this is quite serious stuff. And they just let him wander around willy-nilly. But um, let's, let's get back to it. This is where we meet Dr. Christmas Jones, of course, played by Denise Richards. Uh, Richards is a former fashion model. And she's appeared in quite a lot of films and TV shows over the years. Uh, Starship Troopers, The Bold and the Beautiful, and Wild Things, just to name a few. Denise Richards is one of those actresses, Andy, where I recognise her, but I can never place what she's actually been in. So I remember her from Starship Troopers, but other than that, I don't really remember doing much else. But obviously, she's, she's done lots of film and TV shows. Yeah, Starship Troopers, I think, is the one that I mainly remember her from. And she is or was married to Charlie Sheen. Otherwise... Was, yeah. yeah, yeah. Otherwise I couldn't tell you much about her, other than I remembered her being in a Bond film. Yeah, so The World Is Not Enough was the first Bond film to win a Golden Raspberry Award when Richards won the be well, best... When Richards won the Worst Supporting Actress Award in 1999. This isn't the last time that a Bond film wins in a category for the Golden Raspberries either. So I thought that was, well, I'm going to say I thought it was surprising, but I'm not surprised, Andy, because we know we've talked about various awards that, you know, various theme songs have won and Bond films. So this is the first film that they, it's a Golden Raspberry, which is obviously not something you include on your CV. No, it does seem, I'd say it seems a little bit harsh. Like you, I'm not totally surprised. Um, but I was getting Laura Croft vibes from from Christmas here. I, I agree. When when Dr. Christmas Jones was on the screen first time in those tight shorts, I thought straight away of Tomb Raider. But the Angel Angelina, Angelina Jolie film doesn't come out until 2001. But obviously we've got the PlayStation game. Um, was out beforehand but yeah I agree I, I got the vibes as well for Lara Croft. Bond then goes down into one of the silos he finds Renard and his men stealing an active warhead he briefly captures Renard tries to force him to reveal his plan but Renard resists feels no pain from from Bond's blows and I I made a note here that Bond at times seemed to be visibly shaking with anger which suggests that kind of emotion that we don't really see from Bond very often. And I thought that was unusual because I'm not sure why Bond would be at this point emotionally invest, invested in this mission. I, I agree. And was that upon Andy visibly shaken? He, he wasn't quite stirred, was he there? He wasn't stirred. It wasn't a pun, actually. It's, I guess, pun, pun, no pun intended, but uh, I surprised myself with my, my wit. It's during the kind of interrogation that Reynold uses a phrase that Bond has heard previously from Electra, uh, the phrase, there's no point in living if you can't feel alive. And he reveals that he was the sniper during the earlier encounter in Bilbao. And Bond also notices that one of Renard's men has removed the tracking card from the bomb. So the plot is starting to thicken a little bit at this point. It is starting to thicken, Andy. And this is where Bond starts to suspect, suspect that Electra is dodgy. Now, You've had these couple of instances within, you know, a minute or so. Do you think that was deliberately obvious? You know, because when that happened, I thought straight away, because I couldn't remember that she was a baddie before I watched this. I, I forgot that. But I thought these were so telegraphed as an audience straight away, you're, you're suspecting her. Do you think that was the intention or do you think they were supposed to be a bit more subtle so it was like Bond would pick up on it, but you might not, not all the audience might necessarily pick up on it. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I would guess they were going for subtlety here, but 
it is one of those things because they they happened fairly close to each other didn't they in terms of Electra using the phrase and then Renard using it here that it's it's close enough for the audience to remember it's because it's if it was something that happened like at the start of the film it's probably not memorable enough to take effect here so I, I think it was it was quite interesting placement but I I would guess they were going for subtlety just to plant that seed did you remember Electra King was a baddie no I didn't at all so it, it was quite it's quite nice to see how this progressed as we went along. So Renard's crew opens fire and they try to escape in the melee. So Bond tries to stop their escape but fails and he and Jones are trapped in a silo with a bomb planted. So this is the bit where Renard's lift kind of goes up and as, as the lift goes up it pulls the, the, the string or the, the pin in the bomb that's underneath the lift. Yeah, we get a, a big explosion in the tunnel and there's a bit of a cheesy bit where Bond and Christmas, they're escaping up the silo as the Bond music plays in the background. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But it, I, I personally didn't like that bit, Andy. I thought it was too corny. Yeah. It, like we've discussed previously, when they have like odd sound effects or they've had weird music at places, it just takes you out of the moment a little bit. I know that there's, there's always an element of humour, but... Yeah, for me, it's probably just a little step too far. Uh, we're then flitting between MI6 and Baku now. Electra requests that M comes out to her place. Bond returns to Baku, harshly confronts Electra about Renard using her motto earlier. And how did Renard know about the injury? Um, he concludes that Electra and Renard must be working together. He mentions that she's suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. But Electra convinces him that nothing's happening. So now this is where things are starting to tie together a little bit more, I think. And this is where I I thought Electra was definitely a baddie. The bit where she requests that M comes out to her place. Because I thought that was suspicious. I thinking she wouldn't have done that. You know, even though her dad and um, M were friends, I thought that was out of place. So when that happened, I thought, yeah, she, she is definitely a baddie that suspicious that is so Renard has planted the bomb he stole on an inspection car that's traveling down the pipeline out of control so Bond and Dr. Joan uses another vehicle to catch the bomb while Jones dismantles the device she finds out that only half of the plutonium from the original bomb is there Bomb tells her to let the explosive charge to detonate to create the illusion that they were killed when that happened, Andy, I must, I told up my hands there, where he says about not disarming it, I thought, ah, oh, he realises it's a fake bomb, so it's not going to blow up. But then obviously it did, and then he explained that's the illusion for, you know, them dying in the explosion. So when it first, when it was happening in a tunnel, I thought it was like a dummy bomb and it was like a distraction. So it did, you know, I felt a bit foolish when that happened. Yeah, is, is this where Bond kind of finalises, oh, there's something not quite right with this mission? Now, in the lead-up to this, they're, they're talking about the the bomb travelling towards a, a station. Um, and I've got a massive problem with the maths here. So so what, I won't use the exact words because I can't remember exactly what was said, but basically it's said that the bomb is travelling at 70 miles an hour. And it's 106 miles away from the station. So those are the facts. Bond replies, we have 78 minutes. And straight away, my, my maths brain went, nope, that's wrong. And it's basic maths, isn't it? You know, you know, you do those questions as a kid, you know, if a train leaves the station at whatever time and it's traveling in one direction and the other, you know, it's basic maths. So, I'm not going to do the math right now, but I can I can do you a, an estimate to prove why it's wrong. So it's got to be at least 90 minutes, because if it's traveling at 106, now well, if it's 106 miles away, let's call that 105, and it's traveling at 70 miles an hour, that means it's an hour and a half, because 70 plus 35 is 105. So to travel slightly less than the distance given is going to be 90 minutes. And, you know, you don't need a degree in maths. You don't even need a calculator to work that out. You know, it's just, it's just so basic. 
So Andy, when this happened, it, my original thought was, you know, sometimes people do quick math and, you know, you do it as well, Andy, when, when we're together, you can just, you know, do quick maths. And when it happened, I thought, oh, Bond, you know, quick maths. And then when I read your note here, I thought, oh, you know, maybe you didn't do a maths degree at Blimmin' Oxford. He was too busy doing Oriental Studies, languages, should I say. So after I saw your note, Andy, I Googled it because I know you said it's basic maths. And I agree, it's something you probably did at primary school or secondary school. You know, the, the whole example about traveling, etc. So to put it kind of to bed in terms of what you said, I Googled it. And I found a nice little website that you converted miles per hour into how far you could travel in terms of miles and according to google it is one hour 30 minutes and 51 seconds so andy i'm just thinking you know with bond do you think he's just always early then he's just miscalculated his timekeeping he's just always getting there early and how how often has he been caught out by this you know where he says oh it's only 78 minutes you know, in previous missions and then he rocks up thinking, oh, I've still got 20 minutes to, to spare and, you know, the bomb's gone off or something's happened, someone's died. Do you think this explains the six minutes becoming three minutes in Goldeneye when he sets the detonator? It just has no concept of time. <laughs> yes, maybe. My other thought is that if he says he's got 78 minutes, is he thinking that means he's got about 12 minutes for him and Dr. Christmas Jones to to do what Bond does? Moving on, M says to Electra that Bond is the best that they have. During this scene, Electra is acting suspicious. It shortly becomes clear that Electra is a baddie and M's bodyguards are killed. M is captured is, and is now a prisoner of Electra. This all stems from the time Electra was a prisoner and her dad and M work together and use Electra as bait to capture Renard. We end this part of the movie when Dr. Jones says a brilliant line about her ass, and this made me chuckle Andy because I'm a juvenile and we cover this later on in the pod so you know even though I gave it five out of ten Andy there were some lines here that did make me chuckle yeah it, it definitely has its moments I would say um and you know there's there's more to come let's let's move it swiftly forward though so Caspian Sea and Istanbul are our next two locations uh, we see Electra and Renard together. M is in a cell and she's got the tracking device, but it's not currently powered. And my question here is, why didn't they check her pockets? Like, that's custody sergeant 101, isn't it? For like prisoners, you empty their pockets. Yeah, it was. That was a good pick, Andy. And yeah, it, it seems a bit weird, especially someone in her power position. You know, she's the the head of MI6, so you would you would search her just to check if she's got any kind of um, not necessarily tracking device in terms of what she's got from the missile, just whether you know there's a Q gadget in terms of a tracking device, a kind of like a homing beacon in terms of you know like an SOS core or something like that. So it does seem a bit poor. Yeah, amateur hour stuff. Uh, another note I, I made was that. Emma's got to be in arguably the world's most valuable prison cell. It seems to be loads of art and artifacts just laying all around her within the cell. So there's, there's quite a lot of value in there. And then later on, Electra and Renard are in bed together. And Electra seems to anger Renard. Um, he asks if Bond was a good lover. And she says something along the lines of, What, do you think I wouldn't feel anything too? And he's obviously very upset by that. I think he, at this point he like punches through a, a glass table or a, an ornament or something, doesn't he, and cuts his hand to pieces. Yes, he does. Bond goes to see Sarkovsky at his factory. However, they are shortly attacked by helicopters dangling tree cutters. I don't know what the technical term is there in terms of tree cutters, and obviously you mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, Andy, about being one, not your favourite scene, but one of the scenes that you enjoyed. Bond is able to destroy one of the helicopters with missiles fired from his BMW, but the other chopper saws his car in half. The battle continues and Sarkovsky ends up in a pit of caviar. I think it's caviar, Andy. When I originally watched it, I thought it was oil, but this factory is actually a caviar factory. 
So I do think it's caviar. Yeah, you're right. Bond manages to convince Sukovsky to tell him everything, and that's when Sukovsky mentions the nuclear submarine. Uh, Bond and Sukovsky, uh, they're starting to figure things out now. They figure out that a nuclear explosion in Istanbul would contaminate the Bosphorus, preventing all shipping out of the Black Sea and rendering the Russian oil pipelines useless. Uh, they also figure out that a submarine will be detonated using the stolen plutonium um, and made to look like an accident. Uh, when they determine where the sub is docked, which is near the Maiden's Tower, Zakovsky's assistant, Bullion, rushes out of the room having planted a bomb. So we've got, we've got another betrayal on screen here. And Bond and Dr. Jones are then captured and taken to Electra. And this is a little bit that I kind of alluded to earlier on um, when I was talking about Bond wearing glasses. So Blond says a little quote about the world is not enough. And he says it's a family motto. And this is a throwback to the Mad on a Majesty's Secret Service where he's playing undercover as Hillary. And that's obviously a motto when he's talking about the, the coat of arms. Bond is in a torture chair, which slowly causes suffocation by closing the air pipe in his throat. This, Andy, I didn't write this down, but it did remind me of a future Bond film where Bond is being tortured on a chair this bit did yes and i know exactly the scene that you're referring to um as well slightly different form of torture that one of course um it's during this scene though that the penny finally drops doesn't it it's not renard that's in control of electra it's electra that is in control of renard i didn't know this i think we, we said a few minutes ago neither of us remember that electra was a baddie but i thought this was a really nicely done twist um, that it's actually her in charge all along. And a uh, little little side note that I made here, that when Bond's being suffocated, um, he's trying to talk, and obviously it's getting more and more difficult, but he sounds like something out of The Godfather, the way he, he uses his voice. Which I thought, was, you know, it made me chuckle anyway. No, that, that's a, a good revelation in terms of Electra actually being in control. So, Sukovsky so arrives and he kills Mr. Bullion, and makes his way to where Bond and Electra are. This is where Sikorsky sees his nephew's captain's hat on a nearby table, and Electra shoots Sikorsky with a pistol hidden behind the hat, and Sikorsky falls to the floor. However, he manages to get one shot off before he dies, and he shoots one of Bond's locks. Electra doesn't collar that it's actually um, shot the lock as well, because I think she just thinks um, she's you know he's, he's missed a shot at Bond. But Bond manages to break free and Electra runs off. Bond frees M and then continues his pursuit of Electra. He finds Electra at the top and demands that she call off Renard in, you know, in the submarine. She, she tells him, and I think this bit, I, I say what happens now, but then I'll tell you what I think. So she tells Bond that he'd never kill her and that he'd miss her. She is seriously unhinged. Now, I think, Andy, I don't know what your thought was this, um, of this bit was, she's really got some delusions of grandeur, yeah, she's really overstating her, or over, she's really overstating the, the pull that she has on Bond here, she's just totally miscalculated the, the relationship she has with, yeah, I just thought that was so weird that she was saying, you're going to miss me, and I'm thinking, seriously? Yeah, it does seem... She's got delusions of grandeur, like you said, and uh, she's obviously got a very high opinion of herself. We we hear uh, there's a two-way radio. Electra yells through for Renard to proceed with the plan. And Bond shoots her. And he says, I never miss. Uh, and this was the aforementioned earlier where he says it actually kills a leading lady. M actually sees Bond take the shot, and she seems genuinely shocked by this. Um, which, I, which I thought was quite a nice subtle uh, insight into her psyche that you know she could even be shocked by what bond does uh, do you think andy she is shocked by bond's reaction or that the fact that one of her close friend's daughter died even though she turned out to be a baddie or a combination of both? Probably more the latter, because I think obviously the close relationship she had with Electra's father. 
It was interesting nonetheless, though, because clearly this is more than just a mission to her. Yeah, this is this is personal in many ways. Bond dives off the top of the tower, makes his way onto the submarine, and once again rescues Doctor Jones. Um, he kills most of Reynolds' men, but the terrorist locks himself in the reactor room. Uh, the sub is sinking instead of going up. I think he's he's trying to bring it to the surface, isn't he? Uh, but obviously gets it wrong and uh, it says. I think he says there's been a slight miscalculation or something about a technical error. Yeah, and and yeah, I, I quite I'm quite envious of Bond because you know when things are kicking off, this is you know he's potentially going to drown, um, that the sub is sinking, and then he just pulls out a little one calm one liner about slight miscalculation. I I hope I'm on I hope I'm that cool under pressure and still pop out some one liners if I'm ever sinking in a submarine so bond uses a missile hatch to get to the other section to confront renard bond and renard have the customary boss fight and we get a few one-liners here and from memory renard even pulls out some um one-liners bond gets the upper hand and renard is killed bond and dr jones manage to escape from the submarine before it blows up we then transition to mi6 slash turkey and we get a little bit of a romantic scene here with Bond and Christmas. It's more of Bond being Bond, isn't it? But back at MI6, um, M and the gang, they've, they've got a heat satellite that they're looking at and they notice that Bond and Christmas are, are clearly up to what Bond gets up to. And we get a nice little quote from Bond here, which we're going to get to very shortly because that brings us to the end of the film and uh, moving on to some one-liners and quotes. The rain room. I will start this time round, and I think we mentioned this earlier on, the kind of interplay between Moneypenny and Bond early in the film. So Moneypenny starts, James, have you bought me a souvenir from your trip? Chocolates? An engagement ring? To which Bond replies, I thought you might enjoy one of these, and hands her a cigar tube. Uh, Money Penny replies, "How romantic! I know exactly where to put that." Uh, just as she then throws it in the bin, and Bond has the final say here with, "Oh, Money Penny, the story of our relationship, close but no cigar." I think that's a brilliant little interchange between Money Penny and Bond. This one is the one that I kind of alluded to earlier between Bond and R. So James Bond says, "If you are Q, does that make him R?" And then R comes back goes, ah, yes, the legendary 007 wit, or at least half of it. And that did make me chuckle, Andy. And I think I I actually laughed. I lolled. It did make me um, chuckle with that one. Did you did you loll or did you ruffle a mayo? <laughs> As the kids might yeah. say. <laughs> uh, next up we have uh, the exchange i was just talking about at the end of the film james bond says to dr christmas jones i was wrong about you and jones says yeah how so i thought christmas only comes once a year which is uh, that's quite the reply by bond there bond is very naughty in this this film isn't he and this is another one between dr christmas jones and bond so dr christmas says the world's greatest terrorist running around with six kilos of weapon grade plutonium can't be good i gotta get it back or someone's gonna have my ass and then james bond says first things first and that was another one that made me chuckle i've got to correct you there jay she's, she's gonna have a have my ass because she's a, she's american from america <laughs> so uh, it's, i can't it's, do accent ass 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 yeah I'll I'll do the voices. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll we'll edit this out. I'm sure. Um, next up, we've got Bond and Q. Uh, Bond says, "You're not retiring anytime soon, are you?" Q replies, "Now pay attention, 007. I've always tried to teach you two things. First, never let them see you bleed." And Bond asks, "And the second? To which Q replies, "Always have an escape plan." And I think it's at that point he. Kind of lowers himself, doesn't he, from the platform out of the room. So uh, nicely done by Q. 
Yeah, very nicely done. This one is between Electra and Bond. And Electra says, I could have given you the world. And Bond says, the world is not enough. And she says, foolish sentiment. And he goes, family motto, which is obviously linked to an emergency secret service that I've mentioned a couple of times. Indeed. And the final one, we're going back to right at the start of the film, actually, with um, the cigar girl, or secretary as she is at the time, and Bond. And uh, she says, would you like to check my figures? And Bond replies, oh, I'm sure they're perfectly rounded. We've had some good little quotes in this movie, so that's why this segment of the show is a bit longer than usual. And moving on to our next usual segment, and this is the book first movie. And kicking us off is the first point here. So the MI6 operative who was killed for the classified report is revealed to be 0012, who is a rookie agent. This is a bit at the beginning where he goes to the Swiss banker um, to get the money. Uh, there's a slight difference in the conference the staff conference for mi6 at castle thane the female assassin that works under renard is identified as julietta da vinci whereas in the movie she's simply referred to as cigar girl and mr bullion is written as a larger more menacing character in the book than in the film at, at Sikorsky's casino electra quote unquote loses the one million dollars in a rigged game of blackjack Whereas obviously in the movie, she just uses uh, a very simple one card draw game. And shortly after Bond escapes Electra's torture chair, he checks the wounded Sikorsky's pulse, implying that he may have survived. Andy, before we just move on, I find these changes fascinating considering these last few films have not been based on any of the Ian Fleming novels. So they've been ba the books are based on the actual script but then they kind of beefed up, you know, to make it in a novel. So I find these little differences quite interesting. Yeah, me too. And I think we've talked about this before as well, in terms of what do you watch or read first? Do you, do you read the book, then watch the movie? Or do you watch the movie, then read the book? And usually what happens is, or seemingly more common, is a movie will be based on an existing book. It's not very often that it's the other way around, and this is one of those rare examples when it's the other way around. So I wonder how that enhances or spoils the enjoyment of one or the other. Because from from my experience, I, I hear people say a lot um, negatively towards films and TV shows if they don't follow the book to the letter. Whereas I, I'm the kind of person who prefers to do it the other way around. I, I tend to read books that I've heard of by watching the film or TV show first. So... Uh, it's an interesting way around of doing things. Um, but that's enough of that. Let's get on to one of my world-famous James Bond jokes. Are you, are you ready for this one? I'm always ready, Andy, to listen to one of your world-famous jokes. One day I'll reveal where I get them from. Uh, but until then, it will remain secret. But here we go. Uh, what do you call a suicidal James Bond? The world is quite enough. <laughs> it's topical, Andy. I wonder if our listeners realise we've got a similar to Bond where the Bond writers probably have a room full of writers writing the one-liners. We've got a, a room full of writers writing your jokes, Andy. Are you ready? Let's start the quiz. So, moving on to one of my favourite segments is the quiz so i'm just going to pull that up now so our regular listeners will know about this so let me just recap so this is where i will throw four statements at andy and he will determine which two are correct and which two are incorrect so are you ready andy i am ready i would like to point out though that i've done fairly well with these over the last 18 episodes um, but I assure you, I have not seen questions or answers in advance. This is pure brain power on my behalf. It is, I can confirm. There are, there's no cheating or working together. This is, I pull these together totally independent. And I don't even ask the wife these ones, Andy, until after I've thrown them at you. I, 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 
I do throw them at my wife occasionally to see if she knows. But um, there's you're doing very well. Last week you got 100% right. So let's see if you will continue to get 100%. So you said you're ready. So first statement, Peter Jackson, so he's the director that directed The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit films, was originally considered for the director's gig but ultimately, 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 but ultimately, the offer never came after Barbara Broccoli disliked Jackson's latest film. Next one. Originally, the opening scene was supposed to close when Bond jumped out of the bank window. However, test viewings showed that the audience were unimpressed. Next statement. This was Llewellyn's last Bond film as he intended to retire from the role and didn't want a big gesture, hence the slow descent in Q's office slash lab. And the last statement. Bernard Lee, who obviously played M in the Bond franchise, is Robert Carlyle's grandfather in real life. He always wanted to feature in a Bond film to honour his grandfather. So they are the four statements. So, you know, as I mentioned, feel free to play at home and see if you can do better than Andy or match Andy or do worse than Andy. Let us know. So, Andy, what do you think in terms of those four statements? Straight away, I think this may be the toughest one you've done yet. I can quite easily believe all four of these statements. So this... This is going to be a tricky one. Um, I'm going to dismiss the final statement you made about Bernard Lee being Robert Carlyle's granddad. And the only reason I'm dismissing it because is because of your previous history on this quiz of granddad-related facts being false. So I wonder if you've thrown this into... To throw me off the scent a little bit. So I'm going to say that the last one is false. And this is this is tricky. Um, well, the, we could have about 10 minutes of me just thinking now. So uh, <laughs> listeners, if you want to go and grab yourself a drink, whatever, and we'll come back to it. I'll probably still be here scratching my head. Um, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with... Number one is false, number two is true, number three is true, and number four is false. So, there was a slight pause of which we will edit out of the episode, because I'm just writing my notes, because I'm keeping track of where Andy is right or wrong. So, Andy, the big reveal, I can tell you that you got 50% this week do you want to hazard a guess which two you you got wrong um did i get the first two the wrong way around so is the peter jackson one actually true you didn't get them wrong way around but yes that one was actually true so apparently barbara broccoli was a big fan of peter jackson's heavenly creatures in 1994 but when he released his film afterwards the frighteners with michael j fox I don't know if you've seen that one um it's quite a good film she was actually put off by his directing style. So that one is in a correct statement, but you got wrong. So do you want me to tell you, or do you want to try to guess out the, the other three? No, go on, put me out of my misery. So the second statement about the test viewings in terms of the, the opening where they were unimpressed is a correct statement. So apparently... When they did the test viewings, the, the Bond opening credit started after he jumped out the window. Um, they weren't impressed, and that's why they added the whole Thames boat chase on and the MI6 explosion to the opening scene before they did the opening credits there. So they extended it by, I think it's around 15, 20 minutes, the opening scene is, and that's why it should have been a lot shorter. So that is a correct statement. The last two are incorrect. So we've had the first two are correct in terms of the actual statements, but you obviously said the first one was incorrect. So you were right in terms of Lewenon. So 
even he, obviously you mentioned he sadly sadly died shortly after this was released but there was no intention of q um desmond lewenen actually retiring so you know he, he always intended to come back for another film so that wasn't a, a correct statement and interestingly andy you were correct in terms of saying robert carlyle um wasn't the the grandson of bernard lee but there is a little bit of truth in there bernard did, sorry brandon lee did i don't know if i said so brandon lee who's obviously bruce lee's son so robert carlyle is not bernard lee's grandson however robert carlyle's co-star in train spotting johnny lee miller is bernard lee's grandson so that's why i got it from i just tweet the actors so there was a a bit of truth so it wasn't robert carlyle it's johnny lee miller who plays i can't remember who he plays in train spotting i can't think what his name is but you know who johnny lee miller is don't you yeah so yeah you got 50 percent, which is still you've got me on a technicality there haven't you you've got that that fourth one that's that's some shade, yeah. shady dealing by the quiz master. That, w that was a, a bit of a sprinkle of truth with the force. That was mix it all together. That was a, a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Or <laughs> and it's interesting you said about my granddad because I totally didn't get the relationship there when I pulled that together. And obviously earlier on in the the podcast season, I threw a few weeks where i included my my granddad there but that totally escaped my mind andy so well done there so that's the quiz so andy looks a little bit disappointed i'm giving myself a pat on the back there when andy said it's probably one of the hardest ones i did so yeah you, well you, done to the quiz you did master well you did very well the rain room. so let's move on to our um kind of the, the segment that I, I look forward to and this is the rankings review so this is where we we go through each of the areas that we're we're monitoring and recording so as usual i'm going to kick us off and talk about the run times and what we've done here differently this week is we've included uh, another little bit about one time so at the beginning of the podcast andy mentioned it runs for two hours eight minutes the world is not enough and that is actually the eighth longest running bond film so that is that is just one below goldeneye and one above for your eyes only so sandwich there so you know we last week we mentioned tomorrow never dies was just shy of the two hour mark you know only about one minute a lot of the bond films are consistently two hours and above so we're kind of getting back to that now but the thing that we've added to this week's episode is we've done a little calculation in terms of the average runtime for each of the Bond actors. So we've, we've looked at the the five Bond actors so far and Jules Lazenby has only done one film. So I suppose we've got to make a decision whether we take him out or not. But we have used an average and he is the he has the highest runtime. So it's two hours, 22 minutes when you look at your average one times. Timothy Dalton has an average one time of 2 hours 12 minutes across his two movies. Roger Moore has 2 hours 7 minutes across his seven movies. Pierce Brosnan, out of the three movies he's done so far, averages 2 hours 6 minutes. And then in last place so far is the original 007, Sean Connery, clocks in at 1 hour 57. So I would say there's a pattern there in terms of the newer bonds having longer screen time but it doesn't really work out like that george lazenby you know does have the the longest film and that is skewed but it's a 1969 film so it kind of goes against my point because pierce brosnan you know is the latest bond that we've done so far and he's actually in fourth place so i don't know andy if there were any surprises when you saw this in terms of the run times so like you said before they're all consistently over the two hour mark we've only had what's that six films um sorry five films under the two hour mark so i wondered were you a bit surprised when you saw that in terms of the individual actors or not because there's not many minutes is there between them no not not especially and i think we've commented pretty much every week that they're all there or thereabouts obviously on a majesty's secret service is a standalone 
for Lazenby, and it just so happens that that is the longest film we've had so far. Um, but all the others, I mean, even if you take of the 19 films we've got so far, from longest to shortest, it's only a difference of 32 minutes, which is it's quite a, it's quite a wide range, but not really. When you consider you can have, you know, films can last 75 minutes and some like films can last four hours these days. So they're all within a, a pretty close range, it has to be said, as a general rule. Yeah, so that's just a new one we added this week and we're going we're gonna to build on it for these next few films with, you know, Pierce Brosnan's last one and Daniel Craig. So moving on, we've got the kill count and this is bond kills only obviously at the beginning of the pod i said you know there was 27 bond kills so where does that rank and that actually puts the world is not enough into fourth spot so that is one below tomorrow never die well sorry one position below tomorrow never die so that's three kills fewer than the 30 that you've seen in bosnia's previous film and it's just one spot above and six kills above you only live twice so it's in the top four and Pierce Brosnan in his three movies so far is now the deadliest Bond so he has 104 confirmed Bond kills compared to Roger Moore who sits in second place with 90 kills across seven movies and that gives us an average of 34.7 for Pierce Brosnan across the three movies which i see this andy each week it's it's very healthy but obviously it's not very healthy for the people he kills it's a massive step up compared to the the other bond era isn't it when you look at more connery even dalton you know there's a big jump in terms of the kills and i, I just thinking you know in terms of movies out there action movies it's kind of expected to have lots of deaths and you know in action films and maybe that's why the Pierce Brosnan is just as so many more kills compared to Roger Moore like I said he's done seven movies 90 kills Brosnan's only had three movies and he's already broken 100 kill barrier mark so it's a it's a big jump it is yeah the other the other actors you mentioned are all there or thereabouts in terms of their average another way of looking at it is Brosnan has had more kills than Connery, Dalton and Lazenby combined. Sounds even more impressive when you put it in those terms. It does, Andy. And that is why... You're a quick math again there, Andy. A quick bit of math. I should have gone to uni to do maths degree like you, Andy. That's, that's what you pay me for. Isn't it? That's why it, I command that six-figure salary that you're paying me for this bond. <laughs> <laughs> so the last one from me before I pass on to Andy is the Martini watch. And... As Andy mentioned at the top of the pod, he d Bond does drink a martini. So that is all the Bond, all the Bosnian films so far, he, he does drink a martini. Next up, the introduction of Bond, James Bond. And I mentioned this earlier, it's exactly the same as last week. So joint 11th place in terms of uh, shortest to longest. So 30 minutes and 25 seconds. So exactly the same as Tomorrow Never Dies. Slightly quicker than it took for Octopussy at 31.24 and slightly longer than for your eyes only so he he's not in a rush but it's um it's interesting that it was at, at the exact moment um that it was last week next up we have hat watch there's no hats this week no throwing or wearing of hat from bond and yet again no felix lighter so we've not seen felix lighter at all in the brosnan era He's got one more chance to appear, as we know. So let's see if he appears in next week's film. But so far, no Brosnan and Light are on the same screen. And another one from me before I pass back to you, Jay. Going back to the box office. Let's start with the budget, of course. So 135 million is the highest budget so far. So consistently now we're seeing that budget increase quite rapidly has to be said it's not not the gradual increase that we saw in the early years it's quite a significant increase and then in terms of actual worldwide box office takings uh, 361.7 million dollars puts it in first place so far in terms of actual money when we do the adjustment um, for today's today's rate it's actually ranks at number 12 of 19 so 
it's kind of a mid-table film, but in terms of actual money, it's it's top of the pop. So you mentioned this earlier, the three films of Brosnan so far have combined for over a billion dollars, which is uh, remarkable, really. Yeah, it is remarkable. So moving on, we're moving on to the Bond girls. And as Andy mentioned at the top of the pod, we've got three Bond girls in this movie. Electric King, Dr. Christmas Jones, and Dr. Molly Wallflash. I think this is the first in the Bond franchise where Bond has two Bond girls that are doctors. So I think that is a first. In in terms of one film, uh, I do think that's a first. I think, I think you might be right, yeah. Two two doctors and a king. <laughs> Sounds like a, another type of film, doesn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to start from the bottom this time. And the, you know, I, I've kind of mentioned this before. You always get one or two main Bond girls, and then you kind of got a, a supporting Bond girl. And in this film, it's Dr. Molly Warnflash. So for me, I can never put the supporting Bond girl too high because of the lack of screen time. So I've put Dr. Warnflash in 54th position, and that is just below Chumi from The Man with a Golden Gun and Pola Ivanova from A View to a Kill. So, where does that leave Dr. Christmas Jones and Electric King? Now, Dr. Christmas Jones, I think, as I said earlier, she is quite weak, I think, in terms of a Bond girl. She's obviously very attractive, but in terms of the, the actual Bond girl, I think she's been miscast, really, Denise Richards in this. And for me, Dr. Christmas Jones was quite a, a peripheral Bond girl. And what I mean by that, I think she added very little to the movie, apart from be, being a bit of eye candy. So I couldn't place her too high on my list. And like always, I kind of worked my way from the bottom. And I got to Mayday. So Grace Jones in A View to a Kill and Merry Goodnight. And I thought, oh, I can't really put, um, you know, Denise Richards above um, Grace Jones there. So Dr. Christmas Jones is in 35th place, just one below Mayday and just one above Naomi from The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, Electra King, I thought she was fine. I think she's very attractive. But again, I worked my way up slowly, you know, you know, each moving up. So she went above Natalia Simonova from GoldenEye. Keep working my way up. And I got to Stacey Sutton, Xena on the top, and Kissy Suzuki. And I thought, ah, oh, I think, you know, she is good, Bond girl. We're going to talk about a villain shortly. But for me, I couldn't move her above Xena on a top Andy. So that's why I put her in. And you know, in my ranking, you know, two weeks ago, Xena on a top on my list is a, a few spots lower than your list. So I've got Xena on top in 18th place. So for me, I couldn't move Electric King um, above on a top. So I think 19th position, which, you know, listeners might disagree with me there. But in terms of, you know, we're going to talk about the, the movie ranking shortly. For me, one of the reasons why I only did a 5 out of 10 was the weak, you know, I felt weaker Bond girls compared to some of the other movies. So, Andy, how did that compare to your rankings? So this is where we get into what I alluded to on our previous text message as verbal fisticuffs. Because I, I, I challenge your ratings because I've been, I've been far more generous, it has to be said. So in terms of the order of the three, I agree with you. I've put Dr. Molly Warmflash at the bottom of the three. But even though it was, she was a, a bit part player, she was she was a strong character in that she had some say over whether he got cleared or not. So there's there's some tie into the story. It wasn't just wasn't just a random Bond girl for the sake of it. There was you know he, he did have a a mission to fulfil within that scene. Um, but it, because of the lack of screen time, like you said, it's difficult to place her particularly highly. So 
I go through the same sort of exercise as you, where I, you know, I go through kind of the list and try and get reference points. And it's interesting that you mentioned Paula Ivanova and Chew Me, because I've got a, just a few places below her, below those two on my list as well. Just, just I've got them placed slightly higher. So Dr. Molly One Flash for me comes in at 44. Um, and, and for the listeners' reference, we have 66 in total on the list. So it's kind of bottom third. Respectable, but difficult to place much higher. Uh, next up, going further up the list, is Dr. Christmas Jones. Now... I've been a little bit more generous. I thought she was a fairly strong character, but dare I say not necessarily portrayed that well, which is kind of goes to the earlier fact that you mentioned about her winning a Razzie for Worst Supporting Actress. Just, yeah, not, not the best choice in terms of uh, acting talents. Certainly had other talents on display. Um, that gets her a few points higher on the list. But for me, she goes in at 22. So top third. Uh, just below Natalia Simonova from GoldenEye. Just above Magda from Octopussy. I think with a with a stronger acting display, I think she could have been higher up the list for me. But I think that's I've been pretty generous with 22. And I, I feel comfortable with that. And I clearly enjoyed her on screen a little bit more than you did. Um... Electra King, though, I thought she was fantastic as as a Bond girl. And if we remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked Goldeneye, Xenia on a top made my top ten, and it was the first new entry into the top ten for quite some time. I think Electra King was stronger. And for that reason, Xenia on a top gets bumped down to number 11, and Electra King goes in at number nine, just above Honey Rider. That might be a controversial choice to to some listeners out there because Honey Rider is in some eyes the ultimate Bond girl but I thought Electra King was just incredible I think the whole on-screen presence I think not only a look but her her strength as as a as a character and just just everything about her screamed like classic Bond girl I was really really impressed um, so straight in at number nine for me. So Andy, I've got a question. So as part of the research for you know the podcast that we do, I found some articles and posts on Bond forums where people kind of debated whether the actresses for Doctor Christmas Jones and Electric King were swapped. It would make a better film. What do you reckon about that? No, I. I vehemently disagree with that I and I think the strength of the Electra King role you can't have someone like a Denise Richards playing that she's she's not yeah, no offence she's not that good an actress so uh, it wouldn't work I, I agree Andy because um, the actress that plays Electra King Sophie I can't pronounce the second name um I think she she really portrayed Electric King really well, but for me, yeah, it didn't make the top ten for me. But she, you know, the the role is um, well done. And even when I when I read those and I thought in my head about switching them around, I just thought no, it wouldn't add anything to the film for me. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's good that we have this debate, and uh, I think this is this is the week where we start to really go against each other in terms of our opinions but spoiler alert for the next one theme song i think we're going to be pretty close on our opinions with this so the theme song was the world is not enough by garbage dare i use the obvious and say the song was a bit garbage um not particularly a fan just for me it it reminds me of last week's tomorrow never dies by cheryl crow in that it doesn't really feel like a bond song so I thought it was quite a weak effort. Slightly preferred it, but only slightly. So for me, it goes in at 17 out of 19, with only Tomorrow Never Dies and The Man With The Golden Gun below it. Not not the best Bond song in the world. What about you, Jay? I agree. So I actually put it in 17 spot as well, but slightly different order. So I listen to Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Under world is not enough a few times on the spotify playlist that we have 
And I was doing an hour in, but I thought tomorrow never dies was slightly better. So I've actually got my bottom three is from Russia with Love, um, The Man with a Golden Gun, and then The World is Not Enough. So we both agree there. So that's quite reassuring. And I agree. I thought when I listened to this, I thought, I mean, well, it reminded me of your comment last week where you said, it doesn't feel like a, a Bond film for Tomorrow Never Dies. And I thought when this came on, listening to it, I agreed. I thought this, these 90 films, apart from Golden Eye, have been a bit of a miss in terms of the, the theme songs um, from my point of view. So that moves us on to the opening credits. And for me, last week, Tomorrow Never Dies, I put into third spot and I really like the kind of x-ray effects and you kind of get the, the circuit, circuit board kind of images and the models morphed and we kind of mentioned about the Terminator kind of special effects there so I was looking forward to this movie to see you know whether that's going to be consistently quite um good opening credits but I was a bit disappointed and so what so, you know just to recap what we said earlier you've got your usual Bond models you've got lots of oil in the special effects so you kind of got like the, the pool of oil oil pumps models covered in oil um, some flames and globes for me it was a big miss compared to last week's one which I really enjoyed so I put it in 15th spot out of the 19 Andy did we agree on this one or did we disagree so just like last week we massively disagree again so you went quite high last week with tomorrow never dies didn't you put it in the top three whereas I felt I could understand what they were trying to achieve but it just didn't work so I put them down at 15 whereas this time round I've got the world is not enough credits in them number five so just below Goldeneye I think this is for me was an example of what they were trying to do last week but done well like it really tied into the the story of the film and it was it was clean this the the effects were really strong um, last week was a miss for me. Well, this week I really enjoyed it. I just thought it it fit quite nicely. Um, so yeah, top five. Next up, we're going to talk villains. Now we had a whole list of villains. I think this may be the longest villain list for a single film we've had so far. I may be wrong on that, but we've got six villains to go through here. So bear with us. Uh, we've now got sixty three entries in total. I want to go bottom to top again and we've we've seen this in a number of films now where we kind of have secondary villains that are either small parts don't really have much of an impact and there's quite a few of those that fall into that category for me so from moving from bottom to top uh in at 58 out of 63 i've got sasha davidoff a nothing character really not a lot to say about it just generic heavy dare i say and that same argument could be made for Gabor as well, which I put slightly higher at number 55. Just, you know, they were on-screen menacing presence, but didn't really add anything to the, the overall film. A few places higher. So in at 50, I've got Mr. Bullion, played by Goldie. Um, again, it's, you know, they're kind of interchangeable characters in, in some regards. You know, it's it's a typical henchman bodyguard role, and I don't think either of the three, any of the three I've mentioned so far, really added anything unique or or particularly special. So it's it's difficult to place them particularly highly. Next up, though, slightly higher is uh, Cigar Girl, um, which I've put in at forty one. Now forty one, so it's kind of two thirds of the way down the list. Now this is a tricky one in that she's she's a bit part player she's only in the opening scene so she's only seen on screen for 10 or 15 minutes maximum but it was quite an impactful 10 or 15 minutes i thought um which is why she ranks as highly as she does um as a main character if she was in the film more i think she would have ranked much much higher but we didn't we didn't get to see any more of her unfortunately but a, a respectable 41 considering for lack of screen time, I would say. So then we're going to take a big jump now to the kind of the main two. I've got 
Renard in at number 14. So just one place above Alec Trevelyan, 006, from GoldenEye. I thought Renard was a really good character. Unhinged, seemingly... Well, we, we know he was impervious to pain, which, which adds that kind of frightening element to him. You wonder how Bond's going to overcome such a challenge. And really well played, I thought, by Robert Carlyle. Um, so I was very impressed and put him at number 14. Now this is where we could cause riots in the streets. Electra King. So she was pretty high in my Bond girl list. Sorry, my, uh, my Amazon device decided to <laughs> react to me talking about Electra King. Clearly she's got a bit of a hearing problem. I'll try that again. So Electra King, I put pretty highly in my Bond girl list. Even higher in my villain list. She's top five. Number five for me. I thought the... Not only the portrayal by Sophie Morso, I'm going to say. Apologies if I've got that wrong. The portrayal was really, really strong. I think the... The slow burn reveal of her not being a damsel in distress and actually being a villain that to be actually the villain I thought was really well played uh, really well progressed throughout the film and I think I just think it was a, a really really strong performance and a surprising villain as well in terms of how it unfolded so I I was very very impressed and that puts her at one place above Xenia on a top as well from GoldenEye which is another villain that I waxed lyrical about. So that's my uh, my dirty half dozen, I guess you'd call it. Um, Jay, where do they rank for you? So, yeah, we've, we've got some differences this week. So I'm going to start from the bottom. For me, and I think you you kind of said it, Andy, the, the three at the lower end could have kind of been interchangeable. So I've got Mr. Bullion as 58, Gabor at 54 and then a few spaces well a few spots above Gabor is Davidoff and Cigar Girl so Mr. Bullion I just think was weird just a bit like we said you know a bit pointless Goldie being in this role Gabor was the the, the main bodyguard of Electric King and Davidoff, I put a bit higher just because he was the security chief for Electric King, but he died quite quickly. So he couldn't go above, he couldn't go any higher. But like I said, I look at the, the, the people that he is around. So I think he's more intimidating than, say, Henry Gupta, Milton Crest, Dr. Mortner. So that's how I've done it. Cigar Girl. I think like you said, I think she was strong, but she only appears in the first 10, 15 minutes. So that's why Cigar Girl couldn't go any higher than that. This is where we've, we've got a, a big difference. So I put Electric King at 29 and Renard at 27. So sandwiched between those two is El Elliot Carver from To Moa Never Dies. And just above them is Zena on a top from GoldenEye. So I've got a bit of a, a running theme here with the Brosnan films where the the main villains I don't think are as strong as the old classics. So that's why they, they haven't broken in. They, they've got nowhere near my top 10. So I've, I've been just looking at my top 10 there and I've got the, the latest Bond villain in the top 10 is Sanchez from License to Kill. Otherwise they are all from the, the Connery or the, the Moore films. So I do kind of favor the old villains. For me, when I look at the, the villain, Andy, Renard was, there were just, there were very little backstory to him in terms of his character. So I don't know if you would say he was one dimensional, but the only thing that you really get from him was that he feels no pain. And you know, you know that he um, kidnapped electric king but apart from that you don't have much else about him and in terms of electric king when i kind of score the the villains i also look at what kind of plot or what kind of damage they're trying to do 
in the three Bosnian films so far, we've had Goldeneye, where the, the main villain was trying to destroy London. Tomorrow Never Dies, we had Elliot Carver trying to start a war between, between China and the UK. And now Electra King is trying to expand her oil pipeline. So for me, that's where it kind of drops down a bit in the the rankings, and I think that it kind of influences my you know my five out of ten as well for the movie. So I think you know she she was a, you know she's obviously a great actress, and so is Robert Carlyle. But for me, the they're just a bit on the weaker side compared to the other villains that I've got, and I think I do favour the the old style villains. Like I said, I'm just looking at my top ten, so I've got like Goldfinger. A couple of Blofeld, Jaws, Red Grant, Objob, Rosa Kleb, Sanchez, Bunt, and Doctor No. So I'm um, I'm very traditional there, aren't I? And in terms of the old Bond villain. Yeah, I'm just thinking um, of your top ten. Who's the most recent? It's Sanchez. It's Sanchez, Sanchez isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which is obviously an '80s film. So you know, we we have to see how we get on. We've still got one more Bosnian film so we can see the the villain from or the villains from the Bosnian film and then obviously we've got the Daniel Craig villains as well so we, we can see if my kind of bias to the old style villain um, is going to be there at the end of you know this season but yeah we do and I, I I must admit Andy I was surprised when I saw that you had Electric King above on a top because obviously you liked on a top and like I said, on the top um, was 26 in my in my rankings, but in your rankings, like you said, she was top five. But Electric King managed to knock her down a spot. I I like a strong, powerful woman. If you look at my my current five, six, and seven, that's quite the formidable trio. It is, yeah. So what what are your five, six, and seven? Just so the listeners. Electric King at five, Xenia on the top at six, and Mayday at seven. All similar in some ways, different in others. I think Xenia and Mayday have some definite similarities. I think Electra is probably more well-rounded, um, brains and brawn, and unhinged psychopathic tendencies. Yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, Electra King is kind of the girl next door, but she is, you know, psychological problems, whereas Xena on the top and Mayday are more forbid 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 well oh for f sake are more <laughs> dangerous <laughs> <laughs> they are indeed electric king will break your heart on the top of mayday will break your legs so yeah so we, we've got you know the difference there in the bond girls the villains and we've you know moving on to the movies at the top of the pod we've obviously said you know what our scores were five and eight so how does that compare with the the actual rankings in our movies that we've seen so far so out of the 19 films, 5 out of 10, I've actually got a few 5 out of 10s, Andy. So I've got 5 5 out of 10s, a coincidence there. So where did that fit in? We're not having any joint position. So I've actually put The World Is Not Enough is between Moonraker in 18th and A View to a Kill in 16th. So World Is Not Enough is 17th in my list. And that Pierce Brosnan film means that the bottom three monopoly that Roger Moore has is broken. How about you, Andy? So obviously I went eight out of 10. Number two for me, M massive difference of opinion, but uh, the other film I had at eight out of 10 was Live and Let Die, which if you remember, I said was a very strong entry and debut for Roger Moore. I preferred this to it. I just, I was engrossed in it. Everything about the story and the acting and the action I just really, really enjoyed. And and like I said at the start, I think this could have challenged Goldfinger for top place if it weren't for a few things that were just a little bit silly. You know, sometimes they took the one-liners a little bit too far. Sometimes there was continuity or goose that was just a little bit too much. So there was, there was a, the occasional piece that kind of just took it down a notch for me. Um, otherwise, it, it could be challenging for top spot, but I, I really, really enjoyed this film. So it's in the... It's current silver medalist. Yeah, and just before we move on, this, you know, The World Is Not Enough, 1999, is the last 90s film now for the Bond. 
So what we're, we're doing as well, now we've finished the, the 90s, we kind of recap and, you know, go over what is the best film from that era. So just to recap on mine, I scored from the 60s, Goldfinger 9 out of 10 was the best film in that era. The Spy Who Loved Me was 7 out of 10 for the 70s. For Your Eyes Only was 7 out of 10 for the 80s. And in the 90s was Golden Eye for me, which was 8 out of 10. Andy? Like you, I had Goldfinger 9 out of 10 for the 60s. Live and Let Die, 8 out of 10 in the 70s. A View to a Kill, 7 out of 10 in the 80s. And then The World Is Not Enough, 8 out of 10 for the 90s. Let's look at them another way and go movies by actor. So for Brosnan, we've got three films so far. And as you'll probably guess from the, the fact that I've got this in at second place, well, The World Is Not Enough goes to the top of the list in terms of Brosnan films. 8 out of 10. So my, my order so far is The World Is Not Enough with 8, GoldenEye with 7, and Tomorrow Never Dies with 6. How does that compare with you, Jay? Yeah, so it's not quite reversed to yours. So I've got GoldenEye in at number 1, 8 out of 10, Tomorrow Never Dies, 7 out of 10, and World Is Not Enough, 5 out of 10. So for me, Bosnan has kind of gradually got worse. Well, sorry, he's not got worse. The film has just got worse. So I've got eight, seven, five. So at the three films of Bosnan, that means it's a 20 out of 30 and an average of 6.6 .6 for me. The last bit, bit, Andy, there's one more bit that we want to just talk about in terms of movies by actors is the averages by Bond. And this is a, a new one, isn't it, Andy, that we're, we're discussing this week? Yeah, we like to add some stats and some maths to our ratings and rankings. It's, it's not just gut feel, you know, there's a science behind it as well. So looking at the average rating that we've given each actor, we've excluded Lazenby for the time being, just because of the fact that he's only in one film. So obviously we know what the average will be. Uh, but just for, for reference, I gave Honor Majesty's Secret Service 7 out of 10. Um, in terms of actors, I've got Brosnan at the top with an average of 7, Connery with an average of 6.5, more with an average of 6.1 and then Dalton with an average of 6. Now that must specify because before we move on to the last bit it'll become clear that's the film's score. So what I'm saying from my average scores is that Brosnan is arguably in the better Bond films. Uh, what does that what does your list look like Jay? Yeah so as Andy said this is the the way that we scored the actors not Sorry, this is the way we scored the movies, not necessarily the actors. So for me, like Andy, we've excluded George Lazenby. So he got 8 out of 10 on the one movie he did. So for me, I've got Connery at number 1 for 7. Brosnan in at 2 for 6.6. .6, followed by Dalton, 6.5. And Roger Moore propping up the table with 5.9. And that kind of leads us on to our favourite Bond actors. And for me... This film hasn't changed the order, Andy, so I've still got Connery at number one and Brosnan in at number two. So even though I thought this was the weaker film of Brosnan's three so far, it doesn't change the order. It doesn't move him up or down. So my number two has been consistent throughout the three films so far. What about you? The same, my, my top three are the same order as yours, Connery, Brosnan and Moore. I think what's interesting as well is we may have touched on this a few weeks ago we we had in our minds what we thought the order would be before going into this and what it's done for me is it's it's changed my mind i think brosnan and brosnan is a stronger bond actor than i expected him to be hence why he's in at number two rather than roger moore um and we talked about the movie average per actor which for me put brosnan at the top of the list but Connery for me is still the ultimate Bond, as things stand. So although I have enjoyed the Brosnan movies more than the Connery movies on average, I just think the presence of Connery is very difficult to beat. Um, so I can't, I can't put Brosnan in, in top spot yet. He's still got another another film to to change my mind, and I'm and I'm open minded. I'll give him. A fair shot but for me connery is still still king of the bonds i agree andy and i know you've mentioned 
it a few times during the season the a bond a, an actor that we might like might appear in a, a weak bond film and vice versa for me i think pierce brosnan was is a great bond but he didn't necessarily have the best films and it, you know it could be i don't mean i think it's difficult to say you know if you had a time machine take pierce brosnan and put him in say the sean connery films wouldn't necessarily mean those films would be better or worse but i think when we get to the end of the the podcast season and we kind of recap everything i think pierce brosnan's films had too many gadgets and too many one-liners but he was a very strong bond so i think he was kind of let down by the films that he was in even though we you know we've scored some of them highly and obviously this week you've scored it the second best yeah it's quite I think the end of this season is going to be interesting, fascinating, mind-blowing in some regards. And what we could do, just as a hypothetical, is we could almost create the ultimate Bond film. If we take the top actor and the top villain and the top Bond girls and the top song and the top credits and you mash them all together, what does that look like? That would be uh, an interesting one to mull over. Well, that's interesting, Andy, because I've got a note that I've made. And my note was, in the end of season special, do a build a Bond movie. But it was slightly different to, so, you know, go with yours in terms of picking the highest scored ones. But my, my question was, if you could build a Bond movie, well, who would be your Bond actor? Who would be your villain? Who would be your secondary villain? Who would be, say, your three or four Bond girls? But I was going to say it didn't necessarily have to be the the highest scoring. It could be the the different ways they might complement each other. So I was going to kind of say in the end of season, do it a build a Bond. So we could do look at one in terms of the highest scoring um, Bond categories. But mine was going to be a look at it like in terms of go for each of those and say, if you were making a Bond film and you could pick anyone, but you can like, you, you could pick a plot, a, a Bond that, uh, you know, the villains, which ones would you pick in that might complement each other, might not necessarily be like the top three scoring Bond girls. Do you know what I mean? You might yeah. have said, you might pick say Xena on the top because she's a, a, a strong Bond secondary villain to complement, say, I don't know, say Goldfinger. Or, you know, you might say Goldfinger obviously had odd job, but in your perfect movie, you could have Goldfinger and maybe Jaws. Do you know, I was going to like pose that kind of, kind of question in our end of season special as well. Almost like um, fantasy football, but fantasy bond. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a couple there. So I'm going to add to the notes there, end of season special to pick the best of categories so what we're doing you know we've mentioned it um, a couple of times is we're doing an end of season special where we're going to recap and talk about various bits um, in the last season so this season we've got 26 episodes not 25 because we're going to have a little spo um, a special end of season party well not a party it's going to be work no play just work Andy yeah we don't like to have fun on the, the pod we we're all business um but I think that brings us to the end of this week. We've got still got a lot to look forward to. We're we're close to the end now. We've got six more films to watch, seven more episodes to record. Um, but we've got a lot to cover. Feels like we're only just getting started. This is a 60 second review by a James Bond superfan. This week's review has been provided by R2. R2, you have 60 seconds. Start the clock. 1999's The World Is Not Enough was the last Bond film of the 20th century, so the producers wanted to mark the occasion by making a film that was much more character and drama driven. Bond is tasked with the protection of an oil magnate's daughter, Electra King, as she is being threatened by a pain immune anarchist terrorist, Renard. Gradually, Bond then falls in love with Electra. 
The plot structure is unique, as the audience knows as much as Bond does, making the story more like a mystery. Despite being a good idea, this fits to a sluggishness in the film's pacing. This isn't helped by rather dull visuals and action, aside from the opening scene. The film also doesn't take advantage of its pain in mean villain, and while Elektra is an interesting Bond lady, the relationship between Bond and her veers into melodrama. The film is also hampered by its need to have all the tropes of a Bond film and the quote-unquote it-girl Bond lady, neutering the film's dramatic weight. Despite this, it's a film filled with ambition and it has an enthusiastic fan base. The score is 5 out of 10. A big thank you to R2 for recording this week's 60 second review by a James Bond superfan on the waiting room. Well, that's this week's episode done. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to the band Sugar Tongue for the theme tune to the rating room. You can find them on all the usual social media channels. And be sure to check out their song The System, available now on Spotify. You can find and message us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram by searching The Rating Room. You'll find all our social media links on our website, theratingroom.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or feel free to drop us an email at theratingroom at gmail.com. Goodbye, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week, right here on The Rating Room.